So happy to be here this evening and to have yet another opportunity to stand before you and to continue to consider those things that we have set before the congregation. And if you were with us from the very beginning, then you know that we have been considering the theme, the church in the modern world. I need to pause for just a moment because I forgot to put the microphone on. Technical difficulties. Again, so happy to be with you this evening and to have this opportunity to continue to broaden our consideration of the theme that we have set before ourselves to consider, and that is the church in the modern world. If you were with us from the very beginning, then you know that we laid on yesterday a foundation upon which we want to build for the beginning part of this week on through the midweek. But remember, we did establish a good definition both secularly and biblically of the modern world. And we did identify the prevailing attitude of the modern world, which is apathyism. A good working definition of apathyism is the attitude that says God is irrelevant. Remember, we're not talking just about general apathy and indifference, an attitude that says, I don't care about God. We've gone beyond, I don't care about God, to God is no longer relevant. There is a nuance of difference in that, but one that we have to understand and respect if we're going to understand the lessons that are being presented. So we're not talking just about people who don't believe in God. Rather, we're talking about people who believe in God and yet believe that his position has now lessened and therefore he's no longer worthy of bringing up in the discussion. That's apathyism. And the problem doesn't necessarily lie beyond these walls. The problem lies among religious people. It lies among spiritual people who are beginning to decline for various reasons that we will discuss tonight. So we established that definition. Then we immediately saw the counter to that position in the work of the Godhead, the Father sending his Son. He sent the Word who took on flesh. The, the, that Word who took on flesh became the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead. And then you have, of course, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. And we see this trio working to a single objective, and that is to leave mankind a written record so that we could continue to understand in future generations who God is, what he expects from us, and what our duty is if we ever have hope to succeed in this life. So there was a miraculous age, and that age has now come and gone. And there is now a non-miraculous age in which we live, and therefore God having limited himself, works in a non-miraculous manner. It's not mystical. It is wholly natural, but that is not to suggest that he is not working. These things we have to spend time understanding lest we leave off with a wrong impression of what the Bible is communicating. And because so many have not given sufficient time to understand these things, we're beginning to see doctrines attempting to creep into the church. These are not new, they have always been there, but every generation we see either those that are not among us who attempt to bring those in, 
and even some who are among us who go off and attempt to bring these doctrines in and in every generation there are those of us who have to make a decision to take a stand and to set the record straight and everything is decided by God through a proper interpretation of his word. So we saw the counter to apathyism by understanding what God is doing, what he has done, what he continues to do through Christ and the spirit through his word. And then yesterday evening, we looked at for just a moment what we have in the word of God. We have God himself, we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We have the mind of God. This is an extension of God. And in the word, the Bible helps us to understand that we have the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom of God. Remember, wisdom is an ability. Wisdom is skill, if we're going to bring it to a term nearer our day. So what God gives us in his word we often say that the Word of God is living and active, as I mentioned yesterday, but what does that mean? What is involved and entailed in that? The Word of God must become alive in me, and then God, through His Word, is able to guide me successfully through this which we call life. And therefore, in that outline that was given yesterday, we looked at it for just a few moments and you were able to take that home and to consider it carefully, but those are the life skills that God gives us for Christian living. All of it comes as a result of what he has left us in his word. So we wanna pick up right there and we wanna to begin tonight and we wanna talk about the attitude that we see that has been in the church for so long and in every generation we see this because we see what's happening and of course it grieves us. We see this first in God. You remember in the adult Bible class we made the point that when man corrupted himself upon the earth turning to violence, we noticed everything that led up to that God responded, as the Bible declares, by being grieved in his heart. And it repented God that he had made man upon the earth. And this is something that you and I experience because as followers of God, it is only natural for us to feel the same way. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, that one text that we often turn to, to capture the idea of our frustration. It's in Ephesians chapter four and verse 26. You of course know it very well. The Bible says there, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Then it says in verse 27, neither give place to the devil. In our anger, it is possible for us to give place to the devil. We've been talking about how God works, but we have to understand that even the enemy of God works in a similar manner. And there are natural means available to the enemy so that through influence, he still accomplishes his objective as well. So the Bible warns us about the doctrines of demons and those things that we give ourselves over to, all of this coming through the influence of the wicked one. But notice, if we are not careful and allow our emotional position to get the best of us, we compromise ourselves and the work that God is attempting to do through us, and we actually ruin a great opportunity. So the Bible says with unmistakable emphasis that we are to be angry and yet not sin. That within itself is paradoxical because it is usually the case that when we become angry, we tend to sin. And yet the Bible is careful to help us to understand 
that emotions don't happen, we do them. You think about that for just a moment. Emotions are responses that you and I make to situations. Emotions just don't happen. We choose to do them even if it seems that they are a natural response to our circumstances. Someone says, well, how do you know that? That's very psychological of you, very philosophical. But the Bible tells us there in James chapter 1 and verse 2, count it all joy when you what? When you fall into manifold trials is the way we understand it. The word temptation is there. But count it all joy when you fall into manifold trials, knowing that the proving of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be entire, lacking nothing. So it's possible for us to respond to a certain condition of life, to respond to a certain situation of life, not the way we tend to see people responding. We're supposed to count it all joy when we experience difficulties in life. How is that possible? How is it possible to respond to a very difficult situation, a situation that is similar to ours today, with joy? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from a humanistic standpoint, but it makes all the sense in the world when we understand what God is attempting to do. That's why the Apostle Paul would say to the church at Philippi, a church that understood the difficulties of life, he would say to them that God would eventually give us a peace that passeth understanding. You see that? This is an incomprehensible peace. Of course, it is given in the force of exaggeration. Obviously, we can understand the peace that God has given us, but it uses language, the text uses language there, to emphasize that this is so out of sorts. Our response to situations is so counterintuitive that it seems paradoxical. And so the Bible says that God can give us a peace that passeth understanding. And there in the context, it's talking about the power of prayer and how God can guard our hearts and our minds in difficult situations through the power of prayer. So when we talk about world-weary souls today, and I have there uh, in the original, I had a Latin exclamation, O tempora, O mores. The definition of that is roughly, O the times, O the customs. It is an exclamation that we often hear people giving when they are exacerbated because of the situation they find themselves. O oh, the times, O oh, the customs. And have you, you found yourself recently saying that in your home, in the privacy of your own home, you begin to want to shout at the television because of the news that's on there? You talk about our political climate today, and you know what kind of mess we're in, especially where the church is concerned. And we are angry. We are upset. We are world-weary souls. Reminds me a little bit about those souls in Revelation chapter 6. You remember that? In Revelation chapter 6, at the opening of the fifth seal, and I know Revelation is uncharted territory for so many because it's difficult to get a grasp on it. But beyond the symbolism here, we can see in Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, the point that fits our discussion tonight as we introduce our theme. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that had been slain for what? For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a great voice saying, How long, O Master, the holy and true? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And there was given them to each one a white robe. And it was said unto them, 
that they should rest yet for a little time until their fellow servants also and their brethren who should be killed even as they were should have fulfilled their course. Do you see that, brethren? We are not the first people who feel under tremendous stress because of what God has called us to do. Year after year, everything seems to be getting worse, not better. And it seems that our evangelistic efforts are not being met with the receptivity that we desire. People are becoming more and more faint and fading and fraying in their righteousness. So there is a big problem and a heavy pressure that is on every single one of us. And this is not new. And yet here to the souls that were crying out to be avenged, God told them, wait a little longer until those, your brethren, who are still alive can travel down that same course. I've come to say to each of us tonight that we have to be willing to continue to fight for what is right. To, be continue, to continue to be willing to lay down our lives, even if necessary, for the bride of Christ. We cannot begin to give up. We cannot begin to allow the world to slow us down. This is the time where we have to begin to speed up. Where we have to regain that heritage that we have lost. And these things we can do with the help of God with the understanding that he gives us in his word. Because his word helps us to put into perspective everything so that we can begin to see that our efforts are not in vain. That even if we are met with death, we die a glorious death. And these are things that will never enter into the realm of irrelevancy. So you can see the complaint of many as far back as the Old Testament. We were in the New Testament, but if you go back to Psalm 73, and you notice there with interest what the psalmist's complaint was, the Bible says there in verse 1 beginning, Surely God is good to, to Israel, even to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride is as a chain about their neck. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and in wickedness utter oppression. They speak loftily and have set their mouth in the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people returned hither and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. And being always at ease, they increase in riches. Surely in vain have I cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I had dealt treacherously and with the generation of thy children. When I thought how I might know this, it was too painful for me. So here we can relate to the argument and to the complaint of the psalmist. We sometimes feel the same exact way. Why is it that our efforts seem not to be beneficial? Why is it that it seems God is losing the battle when it comes to what we're seeing unfold in the world? 
And you have this same kind of thing even in Revelation, the ninth chapter. Very symbolic. But you have a discussion there of Satan and his forces and the tremendous work that they are doing in wreaking havoc upon the earth. So when it comes to Christians, we are world-weary souls. And we often explain, exclaim, oh the times, oh the customs. But what is it about the world that we see today that is driving the church, religion in general, and the church in specific into decline? Why is it that statistically those in a position to know are telling us that religion seems to be fading? What is happening and does the Bible help us to understand any of this? If you were paying attention in the lessons that were delivered yesterday, there was a statistic that I mentioned and according to those in a position to know, they tell us that a full 33% of 20 29-year-olds to 39-year-olds now claim that they have no religious affiliation. And this is only getting worse. It's growing. The problem is going to be even more pronounced in days to come, especially when we understand the various movements that are already afoot, the homosexual movement, the transgender movement, and other humanistic movements that are working to destroy and to eradicate religion from the face of the earth. You have, and I have a book in my possession, where a gentleman during the pandemic, in all the time that he, that he had off, he decided to write a book entitled, A Replacement for Religion. This is a book that he wrote in 2019 as it went over into 2020. But something that he put together, and uh, he is also a co-founder of the institution known as the School of Life. And he will tell you himself, his name is Alan de Bottom. He's a gentleman from Switzerland. But his whole life mission is to educate people in a manner where we're going to take religion strip all of the good parts of religion as they deem them and then they're going to throw everything away that they find offensive. And what's guiding him is an idea that in an age of science no one who is serious about the question of God is going to believe in God. What I'm saying to each of us tonight brethren is this is just the beginning. There is a great battle that will ensue in years to come. And our young people are already at the mercy of this kind of thinking because it is going through our institutions of higher learning. But you can see these things for yourself and look, and look them up yourself. But what is it that drives these gentlemen, these women, these young people to do what they do? And how is that affecting the church? And what should our position be in response to all of this? How shall we guard against the attitudes and trends of spiritual decline? Well, it behooves us, first of all, to understand why people decline in the first place. In our weariness, what is it that accosts us and takes us down a different path where we begin to decline in our spirituality. I submit to you that there are four texts in the Bible and these are parallel texts that identify precisely what the problem is. And it's in the realm of the parable of the sower, the explanation that Jesus gave of that parable. You remember the parable, don't you? Jesus was discussing the sower who went forth to sow seed and then later he gives us an explanation of all of that. He talks about the seed being the word of God and that's where we left off last night. 
the Word of God, translating it into action, putting it into practice, the life skills that God attempts to give us by a precise teaching of His Word, understanding His knowledge, His understanding, and His wisdom. And so, a sower goes out to sow seed. Luke 8, 11 tells us that the seed is the Word of God, and the soil represent various types of hearts. And you have four types identified there. But what's most interesting is the type referred to as that which fell among the thorns. And so in Matthew 13, 22, in Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, and in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, notice how the Bible identifies what happens or what could happen in our state of weariness if we're not careful? And this serves as an explanation for why so many find themselves in spiritual decline today. And it helps us also to understand what our response should be to all of this. We begin with Matthew chapter 13 and we notice there verse 22. The Bible says this for our consideration. And he that was sown among the thorns, this is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Notice that we're talking about individuals who hear the word of God. As a matter of fact, when we go over to the book of Mark and we look at the book of Luke, you're going to see that in every gospel account where Jesus is explaining this parable from the perspective of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in every single one you have under consideration a person who hears the word of God. And that word hear is a word that's important. It comes from the Greek word akuo. It has reference to hearing in the sense of perceiving with the ear, emphasis on the word perceiving, it means to hear with the mind's eye. Does that make sense, to hear with the mind's eye? It actually means to see something by hearing it. This is where the idea of perception comes in. So when you hear something, there is something developed in your mind and you begin to perceive it, you begin to see it. You hear it with the mind's eye. That means you understand it and it also, that particular word, lends itself to obedience, to giving yourself over to a certain understanding. So in Matthew 13 and verse 22, the first observation we make is that we're talking about people who have obeyed the gospel. These are people who are spiritual. These are religious people. These are members of the church. And then the Bible says that the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now we're going to put to the side the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches for just a moment and notice what those two things do. They choke what? The Word. Remember, we left off last night on the Word of God, the knowledge, understanding, and the wisdom of God. Out of the mouth of God comes wisdom. By His mouth, He gives knowledge and understanding. So the Word of God is what God wants to give us. In fact, when you go to the book of James, the Proverbs of the New Testament, the Bible says, that we're, to, that we're supposed to receive the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save our souls. So what does life do in an attempt to remove us from this position after hearing the word of God and through that hearing giving ourselves over to obedience, now you have circumstances and situations that are designed to choke the word. And if the word is choked, what happens? The Bible says in verse 22, the last part there, and he becometh unfruitful. In other words, this process lends itself to a person 
not producing the fruit that was intended as the seed has been planted. If you purchase seeds of a fruit tree and you plant those seeds, you expect eventually fruit to bear. So if you plant orange seeds, you eventually want to see oranges hanging from the tree. You plant apple seeds, you eventually want to see apples hanging from the tree. You plant watermelon seeds, you eventually want watermelon to come forth from the vine. But if you don't have that, then you know it was a bad seed or that the seed was not allowed to produce its work. We refer to seeds as having potential energy. There are things that have to go into play in order to allow a seed to germinate, to break ground, to grow, to bloom, and to produce. And in all of those things, you have our duties as Christians. And if we're not fulfilling those duties, then we cannot allow the Word of God to germinate, to break ground, to grow, to bloom, and to produce fruit. But the Bible says that there are things that enter in by way of distraction. That's what the word choke here has reference to. It makes reference to the idea of distractions. And we're, we're told at least two here. We're going to see two more added by the time we're done. But the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches play a part in this. But emphasis is on the idea of choking. And what is a choke? Not necessarily the person, not the Christian. It chokes the word in the person. Because the word is designed to produce fruit. You plant a seed and it must produce. This is the way God planned it. Look at Mark chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 now. And let's see if we cannot get a greater perspective on the situation here. We move over to a parallel text and in Mark 4 verses 18 and 19 the Bible says there and on other and others are they that are sown among the thorns. These are they that have heard the word and the cares of the world. Notice cares here is now plural. Don't gloss over these very minor things in scripture in Matthew 13 22 care was singular in Mark 4 and verse 19 now it is plural the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things now we have another item cares of the world deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. We're given greater insight into what's happening here from Matthew's perspective. Now that we're considering Mark's perspective, we're given greater insight. And what's going on here? The, fir excuse me, the first thing that I would call our attention to is the phrase entering in. Do you see that there in verse 19? About midway towards the end. And the lust of other things entering in. Entering into what? Ask yourself that question. You look up the word there and it has reference to the idea of something metaphorically affecting your soul. Well, the soul is that part of us in the New Testament that is responsible for our rationality. Remember, according to the Bible in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, we are made up of three parts, body, spirit, and soul. According to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, remember the soul and the spirit are so closely united that they are almost indivisible. But the word of God can divide them. The word of God is so poignant, so precise, it can divide spirit and soul. But the soul is responsible for that part of us that rationalizes. 
It is our intelligence. And it's confusing when you looked at this in the Old Testament because where so is mentioned in the New Testament, the word spirit is referred to in the Old Testament. Oh, and by the way, the word so still exists in the Old Testament, but it has an altogether different meaning. So if you're not careful, you will leave off misunderstanding what the Bible is attempting to communicate. But notice, the Bible says here, entering in, this has reference to affections developing within the soul. And these affections, they make reference to cares and likes, either of someone or something. Now we begin to see a fuller picture because the Bible says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts. So cares and deceitfulness and lusts are synonymous. These are things that we desire. We desire inappropriately. Because when you put into perspective what a care of the world is, and you allow the Bible to be its own interpreter, you go to Matthew chapter 6, and there Jesus was discussing what? He was discussing the bare necessities of life in Matthew chapter 6. We're not talking about living an extravagant life. That may be for the deceitfulness of riches. But the import there of that phrase is altogether something different than living extravagantly. The cares of the world is completely reasonable. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was arguing, not even do your bare necessities of life warrant a position where you can neglect, I can neglect my responsibilities to God. So you can't use what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and you can add to that other things that we deem essential. You cannot add that to a list where you will have authority to disrespect God and to choose that over Him. Not even do the bare essentials of life warrant a position where you can choose them over God. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, you remember what Jesus was driving towards? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All what things? All things that we deem as essential. What we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear, where will we live? Obviously, we don't serve an unreasonable God. He knows that we need those things, which is in the same context. When it talks about prayer, the Bible says God knows you need these things. So as to suggest that your prayer is not something that you're doing to inform God, as if He does not already know. This is worked into His providence. And this is why if we follow God's plan, everything falls in place. God will provide for us. The argument that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 6 is that we are more worthy than a bird. And yet God takes care of the birds. And if that's the case, then what is lacking? Our understanding of how God fulfills His plan and His promises and the commitment that you and I have to have despite what our physical eyes tell us at times and that is that we're losing or that we don't see God at work or that something's missing. We have a trust in God and we know that He's there in the dim mist of eternity and He is working for our benefit. So here when the Bible says entering in, it has reference to affections rising in the soul accosting the soul, taking over the soul, taking over the mind, so that we begin to allow our situation and circumstances to get the best of us. Now, our weariness turns into a problem. And we begin to grow weary in well-doing. And did you notice here, in, Math, in, in Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, what the Bible says? It says, it chokes the word and it becometh unfruitful. Now we have a more definitive 
answer in what becomes unfruitful, it's not in reference to the person per se, it's in reference to the seed, which is the word. The word has to work in you. Remember when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he talked about the word being received as the word of God and giving it opportunity for it to effectually work in us who believe. Our part is believing. God's part is giving the word. Remember the word has reference to promises God has made we usually use the word faith to describe that because the word faith as a noun and a verb has reference to the idea of God making arguments in an attempt to persuade us. The original word, patho, lays the foundation for the word pistis and pethuo which has reference to the idea of faith in its objective sense and also in its subjective sense. When you look at all of that, you'll see that God through his word is attempting to make arguments to persuade us of his existence, of the fact that he fulfills his promises. So Hebrews 11:6, and without faith it is impossible to what? To be well pleasing unto God. And what does the rest of the verse say? For we must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. Notice. That all comes through faith. And God is responsible for creating that in us. It's through his word. Romans 10, 17. So when the word is choked. By other things then the effect is it's not allowed to do what it was intended to do. And therefore, belief on our part has been limited. This distinguishing fact is something that we cannot overlook. And it's, it's necessary for us to make sure we understand this point. In Hebrews chapter 4, you remember there, this very point that I'm making, the Hebrew writer makes as he's writing to the Hebrew Christians. And remember, Hebrews is not written as an epistle, it's written as a series of sermons. And there, in the process of time, as the Hebrew writer begins to preach various things to the Hebrew Christians, he says this to them in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, beginning. Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good tidings preached unto us, even as also they, but now watch this, but the word of hearing did not profit them. It's possible for the word of God not to profit us. It's one thing to receive the word of God, to have it implanted, it's another thing to not allow the word of God to profit us. Well, how do we prevent the word from profiting within us? Keep reading. Because it was not united by faith with them that heard. That's a very interesting point. So you have the word of God intended to do one thing. Then you have your faith, your belief of the word of God bringing about a different effect so that you need both the word of God that he gives you and plants into your heart and your belief your faith they have to be mixed that's what the word here means when it says united I'm reading from the American Standard it has reference to the idea of mixing you have to mix belief with the word of God and then you have what God intended for us to have. So you go back to Mark chapter 4 and you begin to become amazed at everything that here God is revealing. But what about the book of Luke? In Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, notice the final piece of the puzzle. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, there the Bible declares this. And that which fell among the thorns, 
These are they that have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to perfection. Now we have a little more of the story. Did you catch that where it says, as they go on their way? So we're not talking just about people who have obeyed the gospel. We're talking about people who have obeyed the gospel and have spent some time in the gospel. As they go their way has reference to living the gospel out. And they, obviously, from time to time, they meet difficulties. And notice that these difficulties have already been enumerated. We have the cares of the world. We have the deceitfulness of riches. We have the lusts of other things. And now we have the pleasures of this life. And they all work to do what? To prevent us from becoming mature. That's what Luke adds to the picture by the time you get to the end of this text. So there are things happening in the world that the enemy of God set in motion long ago that through influence work against us and are designed to prevent us from becoming mature Christians. And remember, the mature Christian, as we noted Yesterday, in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14, the mature Christian is one who by reason of use has his or her senses exercised to discern good and evil. In other words, we are people who know how to live. We live life skillfully. We cleave to the good and we abhor every form of evil. But if that is not the case, then we have people who are religious and yet they're bringing no fruit to perfection. And these are the worst kinds of people in the world. These are the most dangerous kinds of people in the world. Religious people who don't really fully understand what they're doing. Which is why God has always been against a people who reject knowledge. Do you remember that scripture there in Hosea? My people are destroyed for what? And then again, time and again, the Bible would help us to understand as God would plead with his people. In ancient times, he would say to them, don't forget me. God would send prophet. These are mouthpieces for God. God would constantly try to help them to understand that what they needed was an understanding of Him. Oh, that there were a heart of understanding in them, God says through Moses as he writes to the second generation as they are approaching the promised land. To say nothing about the first generation, the only time in all the Bible where we see that God revoked His promise. There in Numbers 14, and 15, when the Bible helps us to understand those spies that were sent out and they came back and brought an evil report. Do you remember what happens there and what transpires? The people didn't re really believe in God. They knew God. They understood what He said. But when they saw with their physical eyes things that were counterintuitive to what God had declared, they were quick to turn from him. And they brought back an evil report. And the entire congregation there saved two people. They were ready to turn their backs on God and to go back where they came from. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to being slaves. Which is tantamount in our position to going back to a life of sin. Not understanding the freedom that God gives us, the salvation that He gives us, that He offers us in His Son, through His Spirit, by His Word. And we have people today who are entertaining that because we don't have a full grasp of what's happening. We're allowing the cares of the world to hinder and thwart our progress. Again, the word cares here has reference to distractions. It has reference to anxieties. 
But the word itself points to those things that we deem as essential. In other words, we have good reason to make certain that these things are a part of our life. I have to work, I have to provide, I have to do these things. And the Bible will not argue against that. But even though that is the case, the Bible is clear in saying to us that not even that has a position above God. So we have to find a way to manage that. The deceitfulness of riches here, the word deceitful, has reference to the idea of the pleasantries of life. And how we believe that if we turn ourselves over to those things that are pleasant, that are easy, this is represented in the word deceitful. It's attached to riches because we believe that there is power in what we refer to as money. And yet we know, time and again, as people have been interviewed, those who have had money, they will tell you money is not the answer. And if we don't believe them, we ought to believe Solomon who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Because his one argument is money is not the answer. And if anyone had money, he had money. He experienced every form of wickedness imaginable. He was guided by wisdom as he did that. The Bible constantly reminds us. And from Ecclesiastes 1 all the way towards the end, Solomon is saying, I attempted to do this, and I attempted to do that, and I did this. He talks about laughter. He talks about mirth. He talks about cheering the flesh with alcoholic beverage. He talks about engaging in sexual intimacy. He talks about building houses and gardens and parks. Anything that you could imagine Solomon experienced. And what did he say at the end? This is the whole of man. That we learn to fear God and keep his commandments. And his voice rings true even today. Because one of the things responsible for our spiritual decline is our thought in thinking that the harder I work, the more money I make, the more that I have in the bank, the more lavish vacations I can take, the easier life will be. And that, of course, is deceitful. Pleasure is deceitful because it causes us to enter into delusions. We think in that moment of pleasure, as we escape the harsh realities of the moment, we think that everything is going to be fine. And yet we don't realize when we come back to our senses, it's even worse. And therefore, we become addicted to various forms of pleasure. Today, people are addicted to drugs, and sex, and alcohol, and gambling. These are releases from the harsh reality of the moment. And all of this is deceitful because there is no hope in those things. And the Bible attempts to, to warn us about these things before it is everlastingly too late. The lusts of other things, these are desires that are cultivated over time. And we think that technology is our savior, as we mentioned in the adult Bible class. That's where we are today. We think technology is our savior. And there's a right way and a wrong way to use technology. But you look at our people. They spend too much time on Snapchat, on Instagram, perfecting that TikTok video. And you have some people talking so foolishly now, they say, well, I'm going to become a, 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 a YouTube streamer. I'm going to make a living like that. And so they want to go up there and do something crazy and make this money. That's the deceitfulness of riches. Not knowing that life is about something altogether differently. And then it says here, the pleasures of life we connect this also to 
the riches, the deceitfulness of riches. But all of this points to one thing, and that's that the world has obstacles within it that are designed to thwart our progress in the ways of God. And remember, God makes progress through his word. The more we know, the more we grow. The less we know, the more difficult life becomes. The way of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. It's hard because we're not living life skillfully. We're not negotiating a good life. I want to end off with this. And you're going to want to pay attention to this because notice here what the Bible says with regard to entering into the kingdom of heaven. This is accepting Christ by the Holy Spirit's message. This is the word of God being taught in its pure and unadulterated form. All of that is captured in the word knowledge. And so it's through knowledge that God gives us entrance into his kingdom. There's an allusion to that in Acts chapter 2 as that was the fruition of the prophecy in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 and 19 where there Jesus said to Peter that he was going to give him the keys to the kingdom. In other words, through the preaching of God's word, through the knowledge of God's word, God was going to give people understanding where the door would be open to salvation and to eternal life if they remained faithful. But you have things and people that are attempting to strip away even the key of knowledge. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 52 then, it's no surprise to read here, in the eight woes against the Pharisees and the scribes that are contrasted with the eight Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. But here in Luke chapter 11 and verse 52, the Bible says, Woe unto you lawyers, for you took away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering you hindered. Now the context here doesn't tell you into what were they entering. You have to do some investigation. You look at the parallel text here in Matthew 23 and verse 13. And you'll notice there that the scribes, Pharisees and lawyers, they were preaching false doctrine and living false examples that put a hindrance before people that shut the door of the kingdom. And notice that here the Bible refers to this as the key of knowledge. I find that very interesting. Because the Bible here explicitly teaches that in order to enter into the kingdom, one has to be taught. They have to be taught the truth. It goes back to the word of God and what God has given us in his word and everything he promises us through his word. So that if you cut off the word, you cut off the key. You cut off knowledge to God and everything he wants to do for us. And there are those who are still walking around just like the Pharisees, just like the scribes, just like the lawyers. They perverted Christ's doctrine. They confronted his miracles. They quarreled with his disciples. They represented him and his institutes and economy to the people in the most disingenuous, disadvantageous manner imaginable. They thundered out their excommunications against those that confessed him. And they used all their wit and power to serve their malice against him. And thus, they shut up the kingdom of heaven so that they who would enter in would have to enter in through violence. Luke 16, 16. And today, even today, people seemingly have to come in the same way because they're fighting against all the wickedness that is prevalent in society. What I'm saying to each of us tonight is we have to continue to fight. We have to educate ourselves like never before. We have to be sent out into the world in such a way that God can use us as effective instruments. No excuse me, knowing 
right from wrong and being able to teach people the difference, the nuances, with precision, the Word of God. The time is gone for us to simply give people a general education in the Word of God. We have to move beyond the stories and get into the meat of the Word of God so that we can give people substantive things to take home that will help them to mature and to live life the way God intended. And only until we begin to do that will we not see the change that is desperately needed in churches of Christ today. We used to be a book, a people of the book. Now, it is different. And everything pivots on our response. And so tonight, if you're here and you need to get right with God, He gives an invitation. And this lesson, hopefully it was a lesson that helped you to understand that even though you're weary and you find yourselves at times exclaiming, oh the times, oh the customs, you know that everything you do and the sacrifices that you make, they all have purpose and meaning. So I'm saying to each of us tonight, don't give up the fight. Continue to discipline yourself, to study, to pray, to encourage, to come to meetings like this. There's so many people doing different things. And most of what we said is applicable in one way or another. We're not talking about extenuating circumstances, but you think about where the church is and where it's headed. And unless we start to get some serious education within the church, we're going to begin to see some very dangerous things transpire. If you're subject to the invitation, why won't you come as together we stand and sing?